Hello Internet. Today we are going to be talking about this. This is the 190mm Maxitov Newtonian from Skywatcher and we're going to be going through my thoughts on this. This is a quite a large telescope as you can see. I'm struggling to fit it into the frame. It has a big aperture so this really is a serious telescope and I'm going to be going through my thoughts on this uh, I've had it for about three years now, so there's a lot to go over. This telescope also this telescope also helped me win the gold, silver, and bronze awards in the 2021 Skywatcher Astrophotographer of the Year competition in the solar system category. This telescope is definitely great at solar system views, but what else can it do well, and is there anything that it can't do so well? As always, there are chapters down below the video, so you can jump around and find the sections that you're most interested in. I will also soon be having another new Maxitov telescope arriving, so if you're interested in how this Maxitov Newtonian telescope differs from a Maxitov Cassegrain, and the views that you can expect from each, make sure you're subscribed because I will be taking an in-depth review at that as soon as it arrives. Before we jump headfirst into this telescope though and what I do and don't like about it, let's do a really quick recap of the types of telescopes available and where this telescope falls within that field. There are two main types of telescopes. There are refracting telescopes and reflecting telescopes. Refracting telescopes are essentially like really large camera lenses. The light starts at one end, and travels all the way through to the other end where there is usually your eye or a camera sensor. You can see a diagram of how that light paths up here. Reflecting telescopes use mirrors instead to bounce the light back and forth within them. This means that they can be a lot more compact than the comparable refracting telescopes. It also means that with mirrors instead of glass, you can create much larger apertures for much less cost since you're not having to grind huge pieces of glass. Here's an example of a Newtonian telescope, which is your classic reflecting telescope. However, within the refracting class of telescopes, there are a couple of types of telescopes that do include glass lenses in them. This is to help you keep stars pinpoint all the way to the edges, all the way to the edge of your field of view, removing coma, chromatic aberration, and even reducing, in even removing spider veins, which although some people like them, are actually an artifact of a reflecting telescope. The, most two the two most common types of these telescopes are Schmidt and Maxitov telescopes. They're similar in their idea, but they differ on their execution side of things. Here's an example of a Schmidt Cassegrain. You can see that at the front of it, it has this big glass plate, which a normal reflecting telescope wouldn't have. This also holds a secondary mirror in place, which removes those spider veins, which we were talking about earlier. So your stars are nice and round and pinpoint and don't have those crosses on them like this, which is actually an artifact. You can always add these in post though if you're interested in getting them back. Maxitov, Maxitov telescopes are similar to Schmidt telescopes in that they have this glass lens on the front, but the Maxitov's piece of glass is much larger and more substantial. And this has a couple of pros and cons, which we'll get to in the next section. So let's go over in more detail the 190 Mach Newt and talk about all of my likes and dislikes about it. Okay, so here we have the 190 Mac Newt. Uh, you can see I've got here a ZWO camera attached. This is the 294 MC Pro camera. This is just here to give you a bit of an idea of scale. This is your standard camera size from ZWO, and you can see it pales in comparison to this big boy. Firstly, um, let's talk about build quality. This thing is built like a tank. I have actually accidentally dropped this, not not from a height, but it was set up on a mount and the counterweights were not set correctly and it actually slid over on the mount and hit itself on the tripod. Um, there is a very slight dent on the back here, but even with that happening, I didn't even lose collimation in this telescope. So it is really solidly built. There has been no issue with my images, even with the slight dent on the outside. This thing is, it's really, really solid. Um, Unfortunately, that also means it is quite heavy, but let's get to that soon. Standard, it does come with a two-speed Crayford focuser on up the top here. However, I have actually upgraded mine. This is the Moonlight focuser, which I highly recommend if you have this telescope to upgrade to the Moonlight. The standard focuser is fine. 
Um, it's great for if you just have an eyepiece in there. But if you're starting to get heavy payloads on this, um, it would be fine with just a little camera like this, but if you have a large DSLR camera, or if you're starting to put rotators and filter wheels and all sorts of other accessories in between the telescope and what you have hanging off the end here, you're really gonna wanna upgrade this. This is the first upgrade I did and it is so good. This new focuser, it just really accurate on the fine and uh, really nice and fast on the large side of the focuser. You can see it also has a quite a fair bit of extension. You can actually even get one that has a larger extension bar here, but this is all I needed for my, my setup. This telescope isn't just for astrophotography though. This telescope is a very solid visual telescope. It has a nice focal length of a thousand millimeters. It is still reasonably fast at f5.3, which means you do get a lot of light when you're looking into it. It also means you take images very quickly. Um, but it's not so fast, like uh, some Newtonians are like an F4, and that can create a lot of issues with at the edge of the field, having a lot of coma and chromatic aberration. Um, this doesn't need a field flattener as well, which is fantastic, because as you can see at the front here, see if I can get some reflections off the light, uh, there is a large glass pane right over the front there, um, and it gets a lot, there you go, you can see just how thick it is there. Um, and this really makes the field absolutely beautiful all the way to the edge. Stars are pinpoint the whole way across the field and there is no need for another coma corrector or flattener that you need to put in. Now, from a looks perspective, I think this telescope looks amazing. It has this really nice sort of speckled look to it. You can see it's picking up some of the red light there, which I think is really nice. I have actually put uh, this top handle on it. It doesn't come standard. Um, it just has the one bar at the bottom here. So I would recommend getting this top handle. It makes lifting it up and putting it onto your mount a lot easier. As I mentioned earlier, it's quite fast at f5.3. That means you do get reasonable bang for your buck um, when you're taking photos with this telescope compared to a refractor that might be f7 or a Schmidt Cassegrain that might be an f10 or a Matt Cass that might be f12 or f15. Being a reflecting telescope, you will need to collimate this telescope. I've collimated this telescope about six times in the three years that I have used it and every time I've collimated it it has hardly been out of alignment. So if you're scared of collimation this is a great telescope to have. It holds its collimation exceptionally well and I believe that's mostly because it's held in place here by this big glass front. It's not held by a couple of little you know flimsy pieces of metal. The glass rarely moves and so it holds that mirror really stable right in the middle there. Of course, if you're having huge temperature swings, you might get a bit of movement, or if you're really being rough with the telescope, it might drift a little bit. But in all my use, it really hasn't moved very much and my collimation has stayed very solid. That's been really good as well because I travel a lot. So I know I can collimate this at home, go on a road trip, and even with the bumps in my car, it's not really gonna come out of collimation and I can really trust it to give me good views all night. This telescope is also well suited to larger sensor sizes. It can actually fully illuminate a full frame sensor. There will be some vignetting on a full frame sensor, but it's nothing that a flat field can't fix. You can see in the middle here, it has a reasonable size secondary mirror. Um, and because it's on a 45 degree angle, it's actually larger than the front of this lets on. And that definitely allows you to have easily have a micro four thirds uh, ASPC or even the full frame as I mentioned. You can see up here what a full frame flat field looks like on this telescope and it's absolutely usable. Finally the last benefit I'm gonna mention here is that lack of spider veins. I think having this glass plate at the front that holds a secondary mirror really makes this telescope beautiful in the photos. They're, all the stars are really nice and round. They don't have that distracting cross pattern on them because of the spider veins and it just gives a really natural look which I personally really enjoy. So moving on to annoyances and things I don't like so much about this telescope. Firstly and foremost is I think the elephant in the room and that is the weight. This thing weighs a good 10 kilos. Um, I would say adding the moonlight focuser and once you've got all the accessories, your kit could easily get up around the 15 kilo mark um, and that is quite heavy. So you're gonna need a solid mount to guide something like this. This is due in part to the really solid construction 
of the telescope, but also just its pure size and that really large glass plate at the front there, that correcting lens definitely weighs a lot. Because of its large size, it has this really big side profile that you can see here. Unfortunately, the downside of having such a large side profile is that it's really prone to movement if you have wind. So if you're in a place where you have a lot of wind, um, buffeting the telescope, you will notice movement. I have an EQ6R Pro mount that I usually use with this and I'll definitely notice that after about 15 km an hour winds, I'll start to notice in my images a little bit of star movement. So at that point, I'll have to take shorter images and then obviously the more wind that you have, the shorter your images will have to be. Now, this isn't a huge problem. If you go and look at my other video about perfecting your exposure lengths, you'll realize that you can take shorter images than you probably think you can and still get some wonderful images. But that is definitely a downside of this. Of course, if you have as much sturdy amount than an EQ6, or if you have an observatory where you're not gonna have wind buffeting it around, then you're not gonna have to worry about that issue at all. My final annoyance really with this is that it's an F5.3. And that might sound like a very small annoyance, but most Newtonians that are sold these days are an F4. And so losing essentially a stop of light or the best part of a stop of light from F4 to F5.3 does mean that you're gonna need exposed for almost twice as long to get the same images as an other Newtonian. However, saying that, I think a lot of the benefits of this outweigh that. And I am definitely glad that I bought this telescope over a standard Newtonian. Firstly, having that built-in corrector makes it so much easier. You don't need a field flattener and worrying about the distance from your field flattener to your sensor and all that. I also just love how they don't have to collimate this. It's really so easy. You can just grab it, set it up and know that it's most likely gonna be very well collimated still. So let's talk a little bit about the visual experience of this telescope. I have looked at this with a couple of eyepieces mostly Teleview eyepieces from the Delos range, the 17, from the 17.3 millimeter all the way down to the four millimeter. And this is a fantastic visual telescope. The views are surprisingly clear and crisp. I've had many people from my astronomy club look through this and be amazed at how much detail you can get out of a seven and a half inch aperture telescope. I had one of them specifically calling out that he could see six stars in the trapezium in Orion and he had never seen that on a telescope smaller than 10 inches. Secondly, this is a telescope that I use when I do my public outreach. So I set this up all the time for the public to look through and they love the views of the moon. A 10 millimeter eyepiece on this telescope frames the moon perfectly and there is so much detail to be seen. Unlike some other Newtonians, this still has a wonderful contrast ratio. And so you really get a feel that you're right there. And having the 1000 millimeter focal length rather than the longer focal lengths of a Schmidt Cassegrain or a, or a Mac Cass, really it means that you don't have to have ultra wide eyepieces to fit the moon in. This is also really good for planetary viewing. It might not be quite as good as a Schmidt Cassegrain or a Mac Cass that have a really high f-stop, but I really love the views through this and I have had a lot of compliments of my views of Jupiter and Saturn through this even compared to some larger telescopes. And I really think that correcting plate on the front helps so much. The one downside of visual with this is you will need a very wide eyepiece to look at nebulas. Having a 1000 millimeter focal length really does limit you. Something Fitting something like Pleiades into your eyepieces is gonna be very difficult with a telescope with this kind of focal length. Okay, enough about visual, let's get on to astrophotography. This telescope is wonderful at astrophotography. It has great, abilities all the way from solar system stuff through to deep space and even galaxies. You can see here a couple of examples of Jupiter, Mars, and the moon. This telescope really does manage to pull out a huge amount of detail of all of these types of subjects. Uh, surprisingly so. I have had um, a 5X Barlow or Powermate in this and you're absolutely limited by the seeing of the atmosphere. You are not limited by the optics in this telescope. This telescope definitely holds its own as a planetary and solar system telescope. The one thing I haven't tried with this yet is solar. I would love to get a white light filter and throw it on the front and plan to do so at some point in the future, but I would assume that this would do quite well at that too. Because of that correcting plate on the front, it also does great detail for deep sky objects. 
Um, you can see here a couple of examples. This first one is Carina, and you can just see how flat that field is. The stars all the way to the edge are still very, very sharp. Um, there's really no coma or chromatic aberration present at all. Here you can see the Lagoon Nebula, and you can just see how much detail you can pull out of those dust lanes. This was photographed under bottle seven skies, so really impressive. And finally, here's actually quite an old shot of mine. This is from about a year and a half ago of the Orion Nebula. And uh, I wanted to throw this one up here so that you could have a look at those details in the trapezium. I find it amazing that a seven and a half inch telescope can pull out such fine details in the trapezium and those stars. It really does just go to show how well corrected the optics are in this telescope. So after all that has been said and done, would I recommend this telescope for you to buy? Let's take a step back and say, this telescope is fantastic. It has very good optics with pinpoint stars and really lovely contrast and color coming through it. However, it is heavy. So if you're someone that has issues with dealing with heavy equipment, do not buy this telescope. But if you're okay with having heavier gear, then this telescope really is a jack of all trades telescope. It is very good at solar system and planetary, although it will get beat by larger apertures. And it also is very good at deep space objects. The field of view will be narrow unless you're using a full frame camera, but it can still do it all. And if you're okay with mosaicing, you can even get some wide field images of larger nebulae like the Carina. This was the first telescope that I bought and I would say it was definitely jumping in the deep end. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this to you as a beginner's telescope, but if you have maybe a wide field telescope, something like what I do with the Red Cat 51, then I would say this is a great telescope if you're looking for that mid to long range focal length, but you don't wanna to have to have a specific telescope for your planetary, a different telescope for your galaxies, a different telescope again for your wider deep sky objects, and then your ultra wides. If you want a telescope that can essentially go through all of the range of mid to deep sky photos, I say this is the telescope for you. And that's what I use it for galaxies, planets, deep sky objects, this telescope can do it all and it can do it all very well. So long as you're okay with the weight and you're able to protect it from the wind, this is a great telescope and I love it. I hope you've enjoyed this review. If you have, please do subscribe. And remember, hang around for my Maxitov Cassegrain telescope review, which will be coming, I would say, in the next three weeks. My name's Rowan, this is Astro with Roro. Stay safe and clear skies.